self-care and stress reduction are so important. I can bet that many of you have heard about self-care. This is a simple, straightforward analogy. You need to take care of yourself first, no matter what. Airplane oxygen mask analogy. When the mask drops, take your oxygen first before you try to help anybody else. Otherwise, you won't be able to. And self-care is really simple. It's about keeping your body and mind healthy. And, and people sometimes overcomplicate self-care, but one can use a daily self-care plan, which involves proper diet and enough sleep and some exercise, proper medical care, preventative and when needed, connection, right? Connection being connected with others, right? What I'd call learning or flow. Flow is that state where when you're doing something, you almost lose track of time. You're so unpressured and so involved in it, you just kind of lose everything. You lose yourself a little bit, you lose the time. Let's talk a little bit more about boundaries. The addicted person through their addiction acts out. And family members let these behaviors slide sometimes in an effort to keep the peace. I don't want to rock the boat here. Family members feel like they're trying really hard to help, but the addiction continues and sometimes it gets worse. Suddenly things feel very much out of control as interacting with a loved one becomes not only difficult, sometimes it can be downright dreadful. Yet you still have the control. You have the power of choice. You are able to implement boundaries to, to let your loved one know that her or his behavior is impacting you is damaging the relationship. Doesn't mean it necessarily going to change it, but it's going to help protect you. I would suggest the responsibility to calmly, clearly, and consistently communicate your boundaries to rebuild a healthier relationship and to protect the loved ones in your care. Of course, the purpose of boundaries is not to punish or to manipulate your loved one into changing. That doesn't work. The purpose of boundaries is to live by your values and to separate yourself from any unhealthy enmeshments or consequences. So simply put, your ultimate boundary should be as follows. You need to be okay no matter what happens. You need to be okay no matter what happens. So beyond that, I would suggest there are two specific boundaries to help you to do that. One, say I will not allow myself to be hurt or unsafe. I will have a safety plan if I need to. And I will not enable unhealthy behavior. I will not take my child, my loved one, my coworker, to further feed this addiction. I can't do it. So safety is an elusive term. What does safety mean? Well, being safe is freeing yourself from dysfunctional patterns and staying healthily alive and building healthy relationships and gaining control over your feelings, learning to cope with day-to-day -day problems, protecting yourself, not hurting others, increasing your functioning and attaining stability. And who, who amongst us doesn't deserve that? Well, well, how do you achieve all of those? Sometimes you have to start by devising a safety plan for you and your family, ensuring that you and they are safe. And the sad reality is that alcohol and drugs don't just endanger the person using it. Addiction doesn't exist in a vacuum, and it affects all people who are exposed to it. So being party to these dangerous effects of drug and alcohol use and addiction can change your life in an instant. So even if your situation isn't currently a violent one, and by violence, I mean physical force or swearing or twisting your words or throwing things or Threatening to shut you up, all of those things are violence. Devising a safety plan is never a bad idea. And it only takes one time for your family and your children or your coworkers and other family members to find themselves in danger. So have one. Have an emergency exit. Pack a bag for you and those in your care to cover two, three nights away from the home if you need to do that. And identify a safe house, a safe place where you can be where the threatening person can't get in there and do things. So this may seem extreme to many of you, but sadly, this is what addiction does to some people. If you ever find yourself in a violent or potentially violent situation, especially with no escape possible, do never hesitate to call emergency services. Call 911, get some help. Next thing you can do is you can start to identify, if you're able, red flag behaviors, those statements or expressions or behaviors that might signal that there's a potential for violence or a potential for something bad to happen and be ready for them. And then do whatever the heck it takes to be safe. Plea if you have to. Agree if you have to. Stay silent if that's what's going to work. Do whatever it takes to de-escalate the threat. How do you know if your boundaries are being crossed by your loved one? Here's some example of what I would consider non-negotiable boundaries. They don't allow you to feel safe. And that, of course, is physical violence or someone blocking your way or your exit or someone expressing extreme jealousy or someone having to know what you're doing and where you are at all times or needing to check in on you numerous times throughout the day. Someone who might isolate you from friends and family. That would be crossing a boundary that to me is non-negotiable. Degrading or shaming comments made towards you, never acceptable. 
intimidation, again, that manipulation does not work, or sexual violence. All of these are non-negotiable boundaries. Now, there may be boundaries that you might negotiate. And on the screen is a boundaries questionnaire that comes from SMART, S-M-A-R-T, is the acronym SMART Family and Friends. And some of these may be negotiable. That is, you may be willing to communicate about them. And you might be willing to communicate them more than once. So think about these. I, I loan money to my loved one, but I often don't get repaid. I'm supporting someone financially, and they should be able to support him or herself. My loved one lies to me, covers up the truth and, and her or his activities. I fail to speak up when I'm being treated poorly. I frequently agree to do things in order to keep the peace or to please others. My loved one has been responsible for causing damage to or theft of my property. I give and give and give in this relationship, but I get almost nothing or I get less and less over time. I seldom think about my own happiness because I'm so worried about other people. And by the way, that double asterisk means that you're probably crossing your own boundary, right? Someone isn't crossing your boundary, you're crossing your own boundary. My loved one sometimes disappears for long periods of time and doesn't make contact. I frequently feel angry in response to my loved one's behaviors. I feel like I can't make plans because my loved one is so unpredictable and the consequences of their addiction are just in, are not capable of me being able to determine which way things are going to go. I need to be ever vigilant. How about I can only be happy if my loved one is doing well, otherwise I'm anxious. Again, that's crossing one's own boundary. You need to be okay no matter what. My loved one's emotionally unavailable much or all of the time. My loved one doesn't accept responsibility for anything, let alone household chores. I don't feel like I'm thriving. I only feel like I'm surviving. Again, crossing our own boundary with that double asterisk. asterisk. My loved one expects me to be a backup alarm for her or his work or school if she or he oversleeps. My loved one doesn't clean up after herself or himself. My loved one doesn't follow through on promises. Again, those are possible negotiable boundaries. And you have the power to determine if they've crossed the permanent boundary or if there's something that can be talked about or negotiated. So let's talk about what happens if a boundary has been crossed. Well, you have several choices. You have the power to do what you need to do. You have the control. Of course, if the person has put your safety in jeopardy by crossing your boundary or boundaries, you need to protect yourself. Institute your safety plan and or take legal action. Get a protective or restraining order. File a police report if that's appropriate. Protect yourself. On the other hand, those boundary violations that don't put your safety at risk may be worth discussing with the other person. They may be your choice. Again, you have the ability to calmly and clearly and consistently communicate your boundaries to rebuild a healthy relationship with yourself and to protect others in your family and in, in, your, in your midst. So how do we do that? What should we say? You always have the right to say no. When you're asked or told by a loved one that you are to do something that you don't want to do, no. Calmly and straightforwardly is so is, is perfect. Make sure you're clear that there's, and that there's no doubt. And there's some other examples of how to do this. You can say, I'm not comfortable with this, or please don't do that. Can you drive me to the liquor store? No, not at this time. I can't do that for you. Someone comes home after stopping at the bar after hours and dinner's still on the table. You know what? This just doesn't work for me. I've decided not to do this anymore. This is not acceptable. I'm drawing the line at you being absent or whatever you might think that is. Or simply, I don't want to do that. So I'm not going to do that. It takes lots of practice to say these things because we're not accustomed to doing so or because addiction has forced us to be really passive aggressive. I know it's an old school term, but it describes it really well. You know, that is indirect negative communication that we exude through anger or resentment or pushing away. And instead of making direct statements, if you're finding it too hard to implement the statements that I just suggested, simply use what would be described as the assertiveness formula. The assertiveness formula, be as clear and straightforward as possible. Again, calmly and as, as you can, and please try not to raise your voice, state what you need or request directly what you need in terms of what you'd like rather than what you don't want or what you don't like. Partner, I feel extremely scared, jealous, and like I and the family don't matter when you spend three hours after work doing things that I don't know about and you come home and pass out. That's because it, it's, it's really dangerous to yourself and it's not fair to me and your children. I need for us to get help with this and immediately. 
that's the assertiveness formula. It takes a lot of practice, but you're talking about you're ultimately having a solution focused approach. You're identifying the problem and you're telling that individual what you need. Doesn't mean you're instantly going to get it. it means you've set a boundary for yourself and you've kept yourself safe. Now there may be discomfort, right? There may be guilt, shame, remorse that comes up when you say these things. There may be pressure to change your mind, right? Keep at it, right? Keep at it. You deserve it. Now, what, what if those attempts to communicate fail after you've tried repeatedly? Or, or basically, how do I help my loved ones or adhere to my boundaries? Same question. Well, one thing to do is to learn about the CRAFT approach, C-R-A-F-T. It's called Community Reinforcement and Family Training, and it's designed to help family members of those who have substance use disorders and to help those families nudge their loved ones away from substance use and related behaviors. We've told by, been told by society that we can't get anybody sober and healthy. You're right, you can't. We've been told by society that we should mind our own business and wait until they hit bottom and that they're ready. We know better today. That's not necessarily true. It's a, the craft is a great method for someone, especially someone who refuses to admit they have a problem or refuses to admit that they need help. And ultimately, craft helps modify your behavior as a family member in such a way that a non-substance using lifestyle is much more rewarding than one that's focused on using alcohol or other drugs for the person involved. So this is not a traditional invention where the family and friends get together and they ask the person to immediately go to rehab. You've probably seen the show. The craft method instead encourages we as family members, close significant others, to reward our loved ones when they choose good behaviors, healthy behaviors, when they choose sobriety and show control. It teaches through the use of positive reinforcement, positive reinforcement. It also encourages us to step back, not in the sense of cutting people off or showing them tough love, but instead allowing bad consequences to naturally accrue when the person consumes. So for example, if your loved one oversleeps after being out the night before or using drugs and alcohol, don't call in to work for them and cover for them. Have them deal with it and accrue any consequences that accrue to them. Now, while the goal is to get the person in your life dealing with addiction to admit they have a problem and to accept help, the craft method also helps you. It helps a loved one. It helps to prioritize one's mental health and improve their happiness. Right? Sounds like self-care. Sounds like boundaries. So what the craft does is it helps identify unhealthy enabling behaviors and find new ways to communicate, as well as to proactively solve problems, to have a solution to these problems. Now, here are 10 really important messages about craft. These are from Dr. Robert J. Myers, who is the developer of craft. Number one, research has shown that family members can successfully learn techniques to engage their substance abusing loved ones into treatment. We can help. Two, you're not alone. There are millions of families are at this very moment suffering from problems just like yours or just like the families. And of course, just simply knowing that others are doing this doesn't necessarily lessen your pain, but it, it can offer hope. And it can offer a belief that others have solved problems that allow them to live more satisfying lives. Research has shown that it, it is easier to get your loved one to listen to loving words than to criticism. We have as many tries at improving our relationships as we wish to take. Craft is designed to move at any pace that you choose. It's about your empowerment. People can be helped at any time. And that means, five, you can live a happier life whether or not your loved one becomes abstinent. Right? You have to be okay no matter what happens in your life and with your loved one. That's the boundary. Craft teaches you how to do that and how to feel good about it. So when you help yourself, of course, you can help your family. You can help others in your wheelhouse because you become a positive role model and because you appear resilient and upbeat and you have a healthy attitude. And that can be infectious in a really good way. We need role models like that in our world. Seven, neither you or a loved one are crazy. You are not crazy, although addiction can also involve lots of gaslighting. All people have problems, and substance misuse is just that. It's a problem. You didn't cause it. Your loved one didn't set out to be a substance abuser, and problems have solutions. Eight, most problems vary in degree of difficulty. Change can be easier for an individual if they have more than one option, especially if one option involves positive reinforcement. People don't like to have their backs against the wall or to be pushed or manipulated into behaviors. Nine scientific studies have shown that labels like quote, addict and alcoholic are major barriers to people seeking help for substance use. And 10, you have nothing to lose and a lot to gain by learning these techniques or getting involved. And that brings us to that question, how can you 
How can we make use of this craft method? Well, through positive reinforcement, using the craft method means that we acknowledge that the behavior of the person when they don't drink or consume or when they act in a healthy way. And this could be main that you could say something nice or that you do something nice for an individual when you witness that behavior. More specifically, here's what craft encourages. It helps us to figure out when the person who is addicted to substances is most tempted to use, right? Is it when they're upset? Is it when they're stressed at work? Is it a particular time of day? Right? This could help loved ones to determine when or when not to intervene, or if somehow they're pushing this further and making things more stressful rather than less so. In the practice of communicating clearly with the person in every aspect of their life, don't just talk about the addiction, talk about what's going on, talk about your relationship with them, talking about how they contribute or don't contribute in the home. Use positive reinforcement consistently. Assess or determine or address the things that could be making them unhappy. No, it's not your job to make them happy. If there are specific things that you have control over of managing or helping with, you can do that. And that encourages loved ones to reward themselves when they work hard and improve their own circumstances. Take the time for the self-care, but also to realize, hey, I'm doing this for myself and it's working. I deserve a reward. You can also work with a craft certified therapist, right? You can learn about ideal times to bring up treatment to someone with a substance use disorder. There are better times than others. Then you can learn immediately how to act on it. If a person struggling cracks open that door of willingness or agrees, yep, okay, I'll, I'll go get some help. Now there's a very specific technique in employing craft that I already talked about, that positive reinforcement. And it's called adapting negative feelings to positive statements. And you can start employing this technique today. You don't need a book. You don't need a therapist. You can do this today. So I'm going to give you some examples. And as you can see on the screen, as you read through them, think about how some of these statements might have been used recently. Could a different approach influence your interactions and your relationship and eventually lead that person struggling with addiction to choose a different perspective or even for you to feel better about yourself and your boundaries? Well, Kraft absolutely believes that's true. Here's a negative statement. You always mess things up when you come home. A reframe positive statement would be, I enjoy you so much when you're healthy or when you don't drink or use. Negative statement, you are always an embarrassment to me and this family. Positive, well, it would make me so happy if you just drank soda tonight. Negative, I'm not having intimate relationships with you when you're drunk or high. Positive, I certainly would enjoy intimacy when, when you're sober and feeling better. Negative, I can't stand it when you lie to me. All you ever do is tell stories full of lies. Well, the positive is, is you know, I really want to believe you, but to me, that, that story seems odd. A negative, right? You never listen to me when I'm talking to you, right? As a man who's been married for 39 years, I've heard that once or twice in my life. Positive reframe is, I understand that some of our discussions are upsetting, but I'd love it if you could help me to work through them. Let's do this together. Negative, don't ever let me catch you yelling at the kids like that again. Positive reframe, I know the kids can be frustrating, but please help me to set a good example by talking to them calmly. Great reframes. More easily said than done, they're tough to do in that moment of high emotion, but you can see the difference, can't you? Absolutely. Now, I want to be fair. I want to give um, informed consent that there are some pitfalls when using craft techniques. We talked about the benefits, right? The benefits are that you feel better, you feel safer, you feel that you will survive and thrive no matter what, and that perhaps you're able to nudge your loved one closer to healthier behaviors, but there are some pitfalls. And of course, one of the hardest parts about the craft method is that family members have to let their loved ones fail. That's not easy to do. I'm a parent of two adult children. It's really difficult to do for parents and relative caregivers and partners or even friends and colleagues. Now this, because that could be what? It could mean that the person feels really sick. It could mean that the person misses days of work. So the CRAFT program also wants family members to let the person struggling with addiction to see the harm that they're causing, not only others, but themselves. And this, of course, impacts families, especially if the family counts on the person to work and follow through with the responsibilities. That can be a serious problem. So be aware of that. Just to summarize, Craft might be a good strategy for you if you'd like to help your loved one get clean and sober and healthier, if you'd like to decrease the risk of violence or tension in the family, if you want to relieve your own emotional distress, if you want to nudge your loved one closer to treatment, if you want to learn to support your loved one's sobriety and treatment, 
And if you want to increase your loved one's motivation for change, craft could be a great method for you. What can you do starting right now? Practice communicating the boundaries like those examples we gave earlier. You can immediately start turning negative feelings and statements into positive statements, positive moments of communication using the examples we've given above and others that you might create. I said you did need to read a book to begin these techniques, but you might find the books useful. An older one is called Get Your Loved One Sober, Alternatives to Nagging, Pleading, and Threatening. And a newer one is called Beyond Addiction, How Science and Kindness Help People Change. You can also find a craft certified therapist immediately if you're looking for that type of help. Or you can find a family coach who employs craft. And as you can probably surmise, I'm one of those people. I work with individuals, but I also work with families. I work with organizations. I work with colleagues and corporations who are faced with some of these challenges. Please be aware that this is a lot to take in. A lot of it is counterintuitive and a lot of it is emotionally charged. I sometimes spend months teaching people about these techniques and they struggle with them. So please, if you're thinking about employing them, be gentle with yourselves. Please be realistic about having to practice and how long change can take. Think about something you might've tried to change and if you were able to do that instantly or perhaps it might've taken a little longer, a little more motivational enhancement to get there. So. Let's ask the question, what can we do to better support those in our care, other than the craft approach for all involved? Number one, learn how to have a conversation about addiction. This will show the family members that they're listened to, that their concerns are, are being identified, and that help is possible. There's no golden rule when it comes to when you should do it or how you should talk to people about it in the family. The key is to do it in developmentally appropriate ways. You might talk to a brother about it, in a different way than you might talk to a child about it. And the reason this is so important is because early conversations can, can alter the life course trajectory in a positive direction because they increase those protective factors and they reduce those risk factors. They help children and others with self-regulation, that is behaving well without any outside monitoring. They help individuals with their physical health and they improve the overall social environment for the whole family, which reduces stress and thus reduces ill health, physical and psychological and emotional. Now, here's an example of how to do that from a book called Telling the Truth to Your Adopted or Foster Child, Making Sense of the Past. It's an outstanding book if you have these experiences. It talks about Amanda. Amanda, age 15, understands today that she was adopted because both her birth parents were alcoholic and unable to care for her. When Amanda was a preschooler, her adopted parents explained to her that her birth parents could not take care of her because they were not healthy and were unable to meet the responsibilities of parenthood. As Amanda reached the school age years, she understood that she was removed from her parents' care by child protective social workers because her parents did not care for her properly. As a middle school child, Amanda learned about the disease of alcoholism and the history of her parents' ongoing struggle with sobriety. And as an adolescent, Amanda is learning that her grandparents were also alcoholic. She's being taught about that genetic predisposition to the disease and her parents are helping her learn strategies to avoid a future of alcohol abuse for herself. Learn how to have these conversations. They are important and they can immediately impact in a positive way that life course trajectory for all involved. Second thing we can do, we can remember what we're responsible for and what we're not responsible for. This is talked about in some family support groups. They say basically that you didn't cause it, you can't cure it, you can't control it. The alternative, of course, is that to realize that the only thing we actually do have in our control are ourselves and our actions and our reactions. The other thing is, is we can't worry ourselves into peace of mind either. We can't worry our loved one into good behavior. We spend lots of time doing that in our lives, but it doesn't help support groups where people can feel comfortable sharing their pain and their concerns with others and who truly understand what they're going through. And these meetings are devoid of stigma and judgments about addiction and members can relate to and learn from each other. Al-Anon is a worldwide support group for family members and friends of those who are addicted to alcohol. Alateen is a division of Al-Anon, specifically designed for adolescent family members. Naranon is similar to Al-Anon, but it's a fellowship of family members of loved ones who are addicted to drugs. Families Anonymous is a group of relatives and friends who are concerned about the use of drugs or related behavioral problems. GRASP, G-R-A-S-P, Grief Recovery After Substance Passing, is sadly just that, a support group for people who have lost loved ones due to substance abuse. NAMI, NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. It provides a wide range of support options for loved ones and people suffer from uh, symptoms of mental health conditions. PAL, Parents of Addicted Loved Ones, is a Christian-based group of parents who help other parents to learn how to cope with an addiction. Smart Recovery Family and Friends, it's a group that's an alternative to Al-Anon 
that focuses more on that science-based method of helping your loved one. And many people who worked with craft or try to employ craft report that smart recovery family and friends is very supportive. The language is very supportive of that effort. I've written a brief report that's titled Social Unity, Restorative Powers of Community and Support Systems. And it's available as a free download. You can see that at the bottom of your slide there. Why do these groups help? Well, we can't do it alone. They help many people to find a better quality of life. We have fewer problems with the addicted person. We have lower levels of stress and we improve our psychological health. And who amongst us doesn't want and deserve that? We all do, whether you experience the addiction or whether it's something you're experiencing as a family member. As we can see, counseling or coaching, right? This provides support. It's a unique source of knowledge on ways to cope with caregiver fatigue. It helps us in the moment solve problems and challenges and helps family members and children and caregivers make sense of these complexities that addiction causes and the emotions that surround them. Fifth thing you can do is you can have regular conversations about addiction with the children in your care. Not just to talk about it, but have regular conversations. These are immensely difficult conversations to be had. Yet what's crucial is to keep in mind that the best way to convey information is first by being a good listener. Please don't be afraid to ask the children, what's, what's going on if you perceive something's going on or your other family members? Honey, what's, what's the matter here? But, but try never to push the topic, especially in those separated people. Truth is, is that many separated people struggle with trust and with being able to open up. So sometimes we need to give them the space and we need to give them the time. Now, remember, some of the children and the family members, especially families with separation experiences, may feel that being themselves and being honest didn't work out so great in the past, at least in the beginning. Boy, I was relinquished once. Maybe I'm going to be abandoned again. So make sure that the children and the family members understand that they are not responsible for the problem in the family, right? especially children. Many children feel that they're under special scrutiny already, and they see their environment through that lens where they have to people please on top of having to deal with feelings of abandonment, right? If it worked, it happened once already, it might happen again. The caretakers must also understand that someone with early separation may develop differently than other kids that might have special challenges that are unmet and that they are usually misunderstood, right? They might suffer from psychological and even physical issues that are not seen in other populations or other members of the family, perhaps. Caretakers need to be rigorous about building these healthy attachments, and that includes professionals. And that should involve having a community of support, talking to other caregivers and professionals, talking to a therapist, reading and educating oneself about attachment styles and early challenges in life is essential enough. Kudos to all of you. You are all doing that by being here today. We help individuals identify feelings. We encourage them to talk about uncomfortable things. And we each coach them to initiate conversations, open-ended conversations, not yes, no questions. Do you ever wonder about why your dad's not here anymore? Do you ever wonder about your mother's struggles with alcohol? Do you ever wonder why grandma and grandpa have difficulty talking about this? Do you ever wonder in a casual conversation? Sometimes therapy and support groups are needed to do these and have these conversations but try to have them, please. We also have to keep looking for behavioral symptoms of people who are had separation loss. These individuals, including children, try to make sense of their story and their identity, right? And they might experience certain things like aggression or angry behavior. That may be frustration. They have withdrawal. They might withdraw from others. Sadness, depression, self-image problems, daydreaming, difficulty falling asleep and nightmares, irresponsible or taking high-risk behaviors. And of course, isolation. All of these are behavioral symptoms of unresolved separation loss. Keep an eye out for them. And above all, please make certain to communicate to children and loved ones that they're not responsible for these problems. They were created by others and they're not the child's and they're not the family members to solve. Be heartened that there are resources to deal with these issues. There are also some support group resources for adoptees who struggle with addiction, separated individuals. So the Celia Center and I collaborate to do the Addiction and Adoption Consolation Support Group. That's a virtual support group facilitated by a professional for all members of the consolation experiencing or affected by addiction, substance use disorders, or unhealthy behaviors. I mean, adoption and addiction. It's a virtual support group that's peer-led, run very much like a 12-step group. And that link is there, adoptionsandaddiction.com. Dual Recovery Anonymous is a perfectly great resource for individuals here because it has two requirements for membership. One has to have desire to stop using alcohol and other drugs. I have a desire to manage our emotions in a healthy and constructive way. And there's adult children of alcoholics. It's a program of people who grew up in dysfunctional homes. And that's what happens with addiction. Homes become dysfunctional. Many say that their 
laundry list, the adult children of alcoholics laundry list, which is the 14 traits of an adult child of an alcoholic, describe the separation and relinquishment trauma experience very accurately, adultchildren.org. Here are some resources, a great article called I Can't Live Like That, The Experience of Caregiver Stress of Caring for a Relative with Substance Use Disorder. There's Education, that social unity, the restorative powers of community and support system. Uh, resources from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Here are some other articles and reports about boundaries and addiction recovery. To recap, we talked about substance use's effects on individuals, and we validated the experiences specific to those family members and, and colleagues and coworkers. We've given consolation members and families a plan in order to take better care of themselves. We've talked about how some of the children and others growing up later in life may be feeling and how to best support and have conversations with these people. Finally, we've talked about some specific resources to support you and those in your care. Great to see you today. Thanks for being here, and we'll see you out and about at the rest of the conference.